Uh, I'm Tom Simpson and I head the SIL team in the Planning Directorate at the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Uh, this presentation is to help demystify the uh, production and publication of CSV files which hold raw data uh, on developer contributions and are used to inform the production of infrastructure funding statements. At the starting position for reporting on developer contributions, in particular section 106, came with the amendments in 2019 to the SIL regulations, which came into force on the 1st of September 2019. And these introduced a new part 10A on reporting, and in particular for the purposes of this uh, presentation, uh, inserted new uh, regulation 121A, which requires reporting on SIL and section 106. And it also includes a schedule two, which sets out the detail of the information to be reported in the infrastructure funding statements. In parallel with the uh, legislation coming to effect, we published updated guidance in the planning practice guidance. And if you go to that at the web address here, you'll see there's a section on monitoring reporting. If you click on that, it, it sets out what is required. And it's, it's worth noting here under the question, how should developer contributions be monitored? It's a statutory requirement to produce a, uh, an infrastructure funding statement, which includes the information set out in Schedule 2 to the regulations, but it's also recommended that local authorities monitor their data through uh, or in line with the government's data format, which is using CSV files, which I'll be talking about shortly. It also in parallel with the PPG guidance, we publish digital guidance, which gives more technical details on producing uh, your raw data, which will then inform your infrastructure funding statements. And you'll see here, when you go into the document, you'll see some links here, which allow you to download templates of the CSV files, which we'll come on to shortly. Now, recognizing this all looks very complicated, uh, MHCLG have been working closely with the Planning Advisory Service to produce more user-friendly step-by-step guidance to help in both the production of infrastructure funding statements and also the preparation and publication of CSV files, i.e. the raw data which the government can then collect nationally to get a better picture of the national situation. And this, the web address here, will um, be populated very shortly. This is still draft now, but uh, at the time of recording, publication is imminent. So let's start with an overview of what's involved in producing an infrastructure funding statement. And this is using the government's recommended approach and data format. So to a large extent, the most important thing is uh, gathering your historic data. Now, the SIL authorities will have been doing that already because there was already a requirement to report on SIL since the regulations first came to effect, but it is new to start reporting 106. And uh, we recognize that this is, in, certainly in the initial stages, can be one of the most complicated things to do because we recognize very often there the information is in a filing cabinet in a, uh, somewhere in the basement. And it's a matter of actually finding what information you hold and then reporting it. Now, um, quite a lot of local authorities use third party providers to record all their developers. Um, contributions information and some of those are able to produce CSV files without having to go through the process I'll be describing shortly and if, if that is the case well you could sit back or not watch this but I think there is some benefit in understanding the output you get from your third party providers so should you be asking any questions about it at least you understand what data the uh, files hold but I'll come on to that again in shortly. So one of the key things is to certainly as recommended by government, is to report it in a standard format. And uh, the most basic format, almost like a rich text file, is to use a CSV file. It can be used across many uh, different platforms, spreadsheet uh, platforms, including Apple, uh, Google, and Excel. Because of the nature of CSV files, which hold no um, formatting it's a good idea to save the, the spreadsheets when you download them into whichever uh, system you're using i.e google apple or whatever you then input your information into the spreadsheets and i'll explain that in detail shortly 
When you're ready to publish your CSV files, you reconvert them into CSV. So at this stage, they, are, they will be as an Excel file or a Google um, Sheets file. When you're ready to publish, you, you save it as a CSV file. You can use this data to uh, using digital tools which process and get the headline information you need to populate your infrastructure funding statements. So this will go into a template. You will add, and I'll come on to why you need to add separately a lot of the data on SIL, and you then use that to produce your infrastructure funding statement. And alongside that um, narrative and possibly photographs explaining the numbers you've got there. At the same time you publish your infrastructure funding statement, we, we ask that you publish on your website um, with a persistent web, web address, your CSV files. And this allows the government at, at a later stage using a collection tool we're developing to aggregate all the data to give a national picture. And what's very important is with time, every time you get a new um, section 106 or steel demand notice, you, you keep your spreadsheets up to date. So that's an overview of the process. Let's start looking at the detail now. So the first thing is to download the CSV files, and I showed you where you can access them. You can access them both through the digital guidance, and you can also access them through the step-by-step -step guidance we'll be publishing shortly. And you'll see there are three of them. One is a develop agreement, which I call CSV1, develop agreement contributions, CSV2, and developer agreements transactions, CSV3. And what you'll notice on them, as I said earlier, these are CSV files, and it even warns you it's, it's advisable to save them into a more local format because if you say if you put the data in, you save them a CSV file, all the formatting you'd use so you could read the data would be lost. So you have to do it again every time you re reopen the files. So as I say, save them as Excel or Google, or whatever. So the first thing is a good idea to format the files. So you'll notice when you download them, say so there's no formatting, you can't read the column headers. So one of the first things to do is, is basically make sure the column widths are sufficient so you can read what's on it. So you basically left clicking your mouse, bring it along to the columns you want to highlight, click on that, go up to format, click on auto for fit column width, and you'll see that winds it. Now it may well be that you have some um, documents you, you want to record here on your website, which have a longer address than that. You could obviously do that again so that you can see everything on it. At the same time you're doing that, because the, um, the collecting tool the government produce will be looking for dates in this particular format, which is year, month, and day. Um, it's a good idea at the beginning to format your date columns as well. It's exactly the same process. You, you highlight the columns you want to format as dates, use your left um, mouse button, click on that, go back up to format, format cells, and then you'll see there's a date uh, tab here and select the one with, say, the year, month and day. Click OK, and now all your dates are formatted in the right way. And you do that for the other two spreadsheets as well. You now want to save the file. So you click up on the file tab here. You want to save as, because you, what you want to do, you'll note when you first go to save, it's still in CSV format. So you want to make sure you save it as an Excel, in this case, Excel file. I recommend doing as Excel micro-enabled workbook. You could just use Excel workbook. If you use micro-enabled workbook and you have people who understand how to produce, my, uh, how to produce uh, macros, it, it can help you analyze the data later. So uh, save it in the right file format. Again, this is set out in our guidance. Click save, and now you're ready. So, so, so let's now look at some of the detail. So we'll start off looking at uh, recording your data, raw data on section 106. So this is an overview of what information you need to report on. I won't go into great detail because this is what goes into the IFS. But basically, you can put it into three broad categories monies and non-monetary contributions that are being entered into. There's no guarantee you'll necessarily get them, they need to be triggered, but 
that's outside the system, but you have to report on those. You've then got money that has been spent and what it's been spent on. And in the middle, you've got the bigger box, which sets out how much money is actually retained at the date of reporting by the local authority. It's been received. It may or may not been allocated, but it hasn't been spent yet. And there are various aspects of this you need to report. So the amount of money received in any reported year, uh, the amount that's unallocated, the amount that's been allocated from both previous years and the reporting year has not been spent, and a summary detail of, of what uh, allocated uh, infrastructure is. So let's have a look at the uh, data fields in the CSV files. And basically what we're looking at are the column titles, and these are the headings that we uh, expanded earlier. So just going through very quickly in CSV1, uh, let's pick out the, some of the key points here. The local authority name. Now, in the digital guidance, there's a link to um, a list of abbreviations for each local authority, and you're asked to use that in your spreadsheets. And I'll come on to that in a bit. You've got the date. Sorry, you've got the uh, um, your, your planning application reference number here. And what we recommend, as I'll say in a minute, is you each. Um, row each planning application for each developer agreement you use the planning application reference number and you put DA at the end. There's the date that you signed and sealed the agreement. You'll be entering the fact it's a section 106 and whether you, or not you publish the a web address you'd include that if you do. The second CSV file is about contributions and the key thing here is that for each developer agreement you're identifying what the purposes of it are once allocated and spent. And we've provided a list of purposes in our guidance, and we uh, recommend you use these. It will therefore be common recording across local authorities. We will keep an eye on how people are reporting it. And if if under other, there are a lot, there's a, a common theme of certain use that we don't have in the list, we will look to expand the list in future years. And we'll uh, in general modified as we see necessary. What you'll also see in CSV2 is there's a link between CSV1. So the reference number you put in here is also common in CSV2. Now, the CSV3, developer agreement transactions, is just that, it's the transaction, it's what's happening with each of the developer agreements. And again, you can see there's a link between CSV2, CSV3, so you've got the same common uh, identification number. And what you have here, the key thing here, is that each time your developer agreement goes through a next stage, so when it's secured, that's the point of truth, the clause has been met, maybe the development consent uh, commenced, the date the information of the money is received, once received, when it's allocated, now the for the purposes of section 106, um, allocated means it's, it's been passed to a team within the local planning authority. If it's gone to a team outside the local planning authority or gone to an organization outside, for example, uh, a, a county council, if it's money for education, you'd record that as transferred. Once the money's been spent, you'd record that. And if you have a situation where money has had to be returned to the developer because it perhaps hasn't been spent, you'd also report on that. And for each of these stages, you, you report the amount of money at that status or stage. But it looks complicated when you look at that, but actually if you break it down to the basics, there actually isn't a lot of information required on each developer agreement. So let's look at uh, an example. We'll work through slowly through um, filling in the three CSV files. Now in this example, this, a planning commission is granted for residential development on the 1st of October 2018. And on the same day, a section 106 agreement is signed. The section one agreement, 106 agreement, is for 100,000 pounds towards transport infrastructure and 50,000 pounds towards green infrastructure. On the 31st of October 2019, it, the trigger clause is met and the full 150,000 pounds is received on the 1st of December 2019. Of this, £60,000 was allocated or passed to the transport team in the authority on the 8th of December 2019, 
And this, this, this 60,000 was spent on the 1st of March, 2020. The remaining 90,000 pounds remains unallocated at the end of the reporting year, which would be in this case, the 31st of March, 2020. So let's look at how we fill in the, the spreadsheet. So the first thing is, as I said, there's a link, each local authority has its own um, initials. And in this case, this fictitious Midwich Borough Council has MID as its identifier. Now in this case, the planning application number was as here. And so for this developer agreement, there's only a single agreement, use the um, planning application reference number and put DA at the end of it. We know it's a section 106, so we put section 106 there. It was secured or signed up on the 1st of October, 2018. If you have the web address or they are put on the web, put the web address in there and record the date you're making the entry in the spreadsheets. As you can see, we're slightly tardy in reporting, that doesn't matter. This is purely for reference purposes. So note the developer agreement reference here. We will come on to that again when we look at CSV2. So this is CSV2 and there were two developer agreement purposes. One is transport and travel, save for 100,000 pounds and 50,000 pounds for green infrastructure. So you can see here, we use the same developer agreement used in CSV1, and we, we have this, the date that they were secured. Now here, each purpose has its own reference or ID. So what I've done here, uh, instead of DA, we now use CON for contribution, and I've called Transport and Travel 1 and Green Infrastructure 2. And again, report the date you put the entries in and say we're, we're catching up because this is an older planning application. If you were reporting on uh, housing units or you know, affordable housing units or places, educational places, you put the units numbers of houses or educational places, you'd record these here rather than monetary value. But in this case, we're not using that as an example. So again, remember, we've got the two de uh, developer contribution references or IDs. Con is for, so con one is for transport and travel, con two is for green infrastructure. So when we come on to CSV3, which is transactions, we start, let's start off with uh, con one. We know that's for transport and travel, and we know that on the 31st of October 2019, we secured the full £100,000. And we give that its own unique identifier, which is now we're calling it using the um, planning application name with TRAN1. It doesn't matter what you use as long as they're unique. But I just find it easier to understand. You can follow each developer agreement if you follow this route. And we recorded the data on the 1st of February 2020. Similarly, on the 1st of December 2019, the £100,000 was received. It's still developer contribution one because it's still transport and travel, but we give it a new uh, transaction identifier and record the date here. Similarly, we've allocated on the 8th of December 2019, £60,000, same developer contributions ID, new transaction identifier. Spent, so spent on the 1st of March 2020, same contribution ID, new transaction identifier. So you can see how it goes. And then here we're talking about the green infrastructure, £50,000. The start date was 31st of October 2019. And you can see here, it's got a, a, a different contribution ID and a, again, a unique transaction ID. And it was received on the 1st of December, as was the uh, CS, uh, CON1. So you put that date in there, a new transaction number. So that's how you fill in CSV3. And in fact, most of the information you require when you're producing IFS is contained in this um, spreadsheet here. And what you'll notice here, I've you've got some little arrows coming down here, because what I've done is set it up so you can sort the data yourself. If you don't have uh, either a th third party provider or you don't have systems set up your, uh, within your authority for interrogating these files, you can do it certainly at a high level. You can do your own sorting and filtering. So the way you do that, you basically highlight the uh, columns you want to sort. Sorry. 
you go up here to sort and filter, click on filter, and, and on if you then click on this, so if you do that, that'll then put these little arrows in. If you click on an arrow, in this case, I'm clicking on the start date, you can see all the start dates that are referenced in this column. Now, obviously, there aren't many here because we haven't got many in the column, but if you had a spreadsheet with hundreds of thousands of a record, every record would be put into the nearest month or the month it was in. And so from this, you can actually highlight a record between certain time periods. So in this case, if we're looking to report and things that happened during the reporting year, you would select from April 2019 to March 2020. And that will just, if you click on that and click on OK, it will just select those records. And similarly, in this case, you can also just select any of the particular stages. So you might want to know just what was spent in the reporting year. So if you've, you've set the dates here, you can now just click on the spent. And again, that will just give you the rows of money that was spent in that year. And from that, you can then, uh, that gives you the information you can put into your um, infrastructure funding statement. So this is, a, I'll quickly run through this. Um, you'll have noticed previously that there's an end date column here as well. You only fill in the end date when um, an agreement has been varied. And the, the purpose for, of doing that is to um, ensure that when you're interrogating data, you can um, exclude anything which is no longer the most up-to-date um, agreement. So that I won't go through all the details, of the example here, but it is set out in the step-by-step -step guidance. So if you want to go through more slowly, you can see it. So in this case, basically what's happened is there was a section 106, which involved um, agreement for 60,000 pounds initially for green infrastructure. For various reasons, the developer decided to go back and renegotiate down to 50,000 pounds. So the way it's reported in your CSV1 is the date that the new agreement is signed, you put that as the end date on the old agreement, and you put it as a start date on the new agreement. And similarly in CSV2, because you'd already um, had the agreement uh, secured, you, but it's now been overtaken by the new one, you put the end date that it was for the first one, and then you put the start date for the new agreement in there. So you can see it's the same reference, because at the end of the day, when you're actually trying to see what's happened, this is now the line you're trying to follow. Because what you don't do is you don't delete the information. Once it's in the table, you keep it there. You just exclude it from any of your future um, sorting. And as you can see here, these are the dates you're looking at. And in CSV3, because we'd varied the agreement before any uh, money had been secured or received. You don't need to report anything here because at the stage of the variation, none of this would have been filled in. So you don't have to put a line in unnecessarily. You just start with the, as you start to get um, your agreement going through its various stages. Okay, so that was section 106. Now let's look at how you fill in SIL. Now SIL is, is different from section 106. Not, not only in what is reported. And so this is again, an overview. And again, you, you can broadly split it into money that's been committed. This, in this case, demand notices issued to uh, money that's been spent and money that's still within the local authority pot. Just quickly going through this, those boxes are in red are what still authorities have been reporting on already. The blue boxes are the new requirements coming from the 2019 regulations, but I won't go into detail on that, but they are set out in the step-by-step -step guidance. But the difference between SIL and Section 106 for the purpose of reporting is while Section 106 is normally linked to, spend is linked to a particular planning application, with SIL, as you'll all be aware, the money goes into a central pot and then the local authority allocate and spend it from that central pot. So there isn't a direct link between spend and planning permission or dem even demand notice. So in terms of what you can report in your CSV files, which if you think about it, are linked to individual planning applications and in this case, demand notices, the only two aspects you can record, which makes it a lot easier, are the total amount of receipts set out in demand notices issued in the reported year 
and seal receipts collected and reported here. So again, let's have a look at the CSV files with the column titles. They are similar column titles, and the only difference is, is the content within them. So if we have a look at um, CSV2, column C, under uh, intended purpose, because we don't know at the point uh, money is paid, what it's going to be spent on, there are a much more limited number of purposes set out. So there are four potential um, records you can use. The basic default is seal. So if you just want to record the amount you've received, just use the seal um, as a purpose. If, however, you feel you can, at that at stage of receiving the money, you can separate how much of that money is going for seal administration and also neighborhood seal, then by all means, in, separate the data with a different line on each for each of these in CSV2, and then have the net amount having taken off these first two figures as your residual seal amount or strategic seal. Merrill seal obviously only applies to London boroughs, and because you do not report anything, uh, sorry, London authorities don't report mayoral seal, they just pass it to the mayor. Whilst there is a 4% administrative cost built in to the seal received, you don't need to report it in the seal files, in the CSV files. So just report the total amount received, and obviously through your administration uh, finance, you can sort out at a separate stage your 4%, but just report how much you've received that is for, for the mayor here. In terms of the transactions, there are only two now, so we don't have the allocated, we don't have the transferred or spent, because it, for the reason I said earlier, you can't identify those through at this stage, because they're not linked to individual planning application. So you can only report on secured, and now when it's been secured, I demand notice issue, but it's been commenced, and when money's been received, and the amount of money for each status. And again, if you just take out all the referencing, there's actually not a lot to report on it. So I hope this sort of helps um, ease the concern about how much or how complicated these CSV files are. So let's look at another worked example. I won't work through step by step as I did last time, but you see it's obviously the same uh, local authority. In this case, it's, it's just demand notice for 50,600. Um, so you basically got the planning application, it's linked to the developer agreement, I, uh, the demand notice, the date that um, it was issued, and here you put the fact it's seal as opposed to section 106. CSV2, you've got the same um, developer agreement reference from CSV1, and again you, you give a unique identifier as a contribution. It's 15,600. And I say here, it was the demand notice was issued on the 4th of January. In CSV3, again, you've got the same uh, contribution reference, which links you back to CSV file two. And for each of the secured and received, you give a unique transaction reference number. And here you can see that the uh, demand, as we had previously, demand notice was issued on the 4th of January, 2020. And the money was received in full on the 5th of March, oops, on the 5th of March 2020. Now, had you had an instalment policy for this payment, or as sometimes happens, developers pass you money when you when it happens to come to their back pockets, then record every payment you get, add it as a new line with the amount received and the date received. And that'll allow you, therefore, to see how much has been received totally across all your still payments uh, over whatever reporting period you're looking at. So I hope that's all understandable. So the detail is all set out in the step-by-step -step guidance, which is available or will be available on the PAS website. And so there you have it. Thank you.